Hi, hello, hi. I'm sure you're all familiar with who I am. My name is Daniel Ingram. I write for a show called Littlest Pet Shop. It's pretty good. Um, hello. <laughs> My name's Jeff, and um, uh, I don't really have any jokes prepared, unfortunately. That doesn't mean I'm not gonna make any. That doesn't mean they're gonna be good. Uh, that being said, uh, this is basically an uh, incredibly boring academic lecture on how to write songs, in which I'm going to go through some songs I've written, <laughs> because I know the most about them, uh, and I'm going to explain the processes by which I wrote these songs, and I'm going to use that to frame overarching lessons that you can use for your own songwriting. So, uh, let's see what I've got in my notes. I don't have a PowerPoint, unfortunately, because I don't own a laptop. So, all right, so let's see what we've got in terms of lessons here on songwriting. Oh, yeah, the other thing is when I'm done, I'll open it up for questions if you have any. And if you don't, that makes things really easy for me. So I'm going to start by talking about uh, the song I wrote called Home, which, uh, if you're not familiar, it goes... It's so lonely on the moon. And anyway, it's a sad song you know, pandering to sadness. So that song took a while to write, and in terms of recording it for bronydom, it took about uh, just six months of work altogether. But the writing process, you could say took, you could say it took a very small amount of time, or you could say that it took like, uh, like a year, because I started writing it at one point and then just forgot about it and then start it again. So however important you want to sound, <laughs> that's lesson zero right here. Uh, if you want to sound important, just like the first moment you had the idea, that's when you started working on the song. And then it sounds really impressive that it's like, yeah, I spent eight years on this. But <laughs> so the original thesis for the song was actually about San Francisco. Uh, it was, uh, I was very inspired by those sort of uh, traveling songs, and I wanted to do a song about uh, uh, San Francisco and like going to a new place, and just this sort of mysticism that you have when you know nothing about a place, but you like see the poster on the wall. Uh, I think that's like a trope in movies. You know, the guy goes up and he sees the thing, and then it cuts to the bus moving. Anyway, so that was the thesis for this song, and so what I do when I first write a song is usually I'll have either a melody or a phrase that comes to my head, and that's what I build it off of. And so what came to me was this, uh, this phrase. When I go to San Francisco. And so from there, I mean, I've never, I don't usually write songs the same method every time, but something I do a lot is I will just, I'll just sit down at the piano, I'll press record, and I'll record my vocals as I just sing random words. So I'll, I'll, and then I'll write them all down so that I know what the syllables are and how they match the notes. And so I'll end up with things like, when I go to San Francisco, I'll eat some jelly beans under the snow. And I write all those down. <laughs> yes. That's a good point. So that's one of those lines that I want to change later. Fog? I don't have a lot of fog where I'm from. I'm from Pittsburgh. I have, sm I have smoke. It's very smoky. Nice. Uh, so yeah, what I, so this is uh, an interesting uh, problem that I had. And if you want to write songs, Wait, who here wants to write songs? Good, a significant amount of you for the songwriting panel. Uh, uh, well, here's the problem. How many of you who want to write songs want to get married? Exactly. I've got bad news. You're going to have to get married, and not to a human or a pony, necessarily but you're going to have to m m find the marriage of music and lyrics and uh, form, essentially. Th three main things, and I'll get to that. But 
When I was writing my verse, the reason I scrapped this song was not only did I know nothing about San Francisco and I felt bad, uh, I didn't really enjoy the mysticism of a place thesis that much. Uh, I created a weird algorithm with the verses where they would keep changing key but never go back to the same one, but they weren't going up. So the situation I, I had myself in with this weird melody was that it went, uh, Once I was there, I'm suddenly here. And so then, um, if I do that verse again, and usually you'll do a verse more than once, it goes. And now suddenly I'm here when I go. But then if I do the verse again, suddenly I'm going. And then eventually I keep traveling down five notes until I just, if I did the verse 12 times, I'd get back to where I started. It was an odd problem to have, so I completely scrapped it. And that's one of those things that you're gonna do. You're gonna like the idea of something, but that's not necessarily gonna make it good. Uh, uh, so here's where the song Home came about, and here's where this first lesson comes about. I was uh, really into the song Go the Distance in that I found a piano arrangement that was like really powerful and I have weird baby hands and I'm not very good at playing piano. So I wanted to challenge myself to play the piano. So I started doing things a lot in the style of Go The Distance where I'm always used to playing chords on my right hand and uh, bass on my left hand. And so I started doing things where I would play these flourishing melodies up here and I would do chords over here in the style of Go The Distance. And so what happened was I was in a Skype call with somebody and we were talking about pony music, and I was like, dude, you want to know how to write like a generic like pony ballad? And I just start playing randomly, and I'm just like, it's so lonely on the moon. And then I was like, wait a minute, I like that. <laughs> I, I don't like myself that I like that, but I like that. <laughs> and so what I ended up doing was I wrote that whole verse and, and I didn't have a chorus for it so I did the thing that I do where I sit down at the piano and I sing you know random lyrics about jelly beans and eventually I got to the part where the chorus comes in just sort of playing randomly and it just sort of popped back into my head this San Francisco melody and I was just like when I come home and so that brings me to the first overarching lesson of songwriting is you should challenge yourself. Because if I had not wanted to play piano better, I would have had no motivation to attempt to learn something that was, that I still can't play. I still cannot play Go the Distance. Let's see. Nope, nope. <laughs> anyway, if I had not really wanted to play Go the Distance, I would never have done this sort of melody I would have never had that spark of inspiration. So you should always be challenging yourself to be better, whether it's, it's uh, no matter what it is. And you know, sometimes you're just, you're just playing at random and you're just like, uh, uh, I have nothing, I have nothing. Oh, I like that. And that's my new single. Anyway, you know, that sort of thing happens. So talking about keys, because I explained the algorithm of the terrible song. Uh, this next thing is that you need to understand uh, how you and how other people perceive different keys. So when I wrote Home and I sent it off to Eileen Monty and Jen to record, they basically said, look, this is too high to sing at the moment. And I was like, oh yeah, men and women and voices and range. And so I ended up bringing it down to C. And here's the thing about C and E is there, if I play the same notes, and then if I play it in C, it's the same melody, but it has a different feeling. And I say that slowly, very slowly, because this is not real. This is not a real thing. 
but it is real because it, it's there. It's not a quantifiable thing, so I figured I'd make it lesson two because that's how importance works, right? The worst ones first? Anyway, it's not a quantifiable thing, but you'll hear it from a lot of musicians, and, and some musicians are more mathematical and they really focus on the way that the notes correspond to numbers, and they, uh, people like that tend to you know, focus on the MIDI roll. And then you'll get into more people who are just like, yeah, man, jazz, like, yeah, we're doing jazz. And they're like, they really feel it. And you've got to get married, unfortunately. You have to find the marriage of feeling and what actually is a real thing. So understanding how people perceive keys is an important thing to notice, but I mean, if your song doesn't work because of a key change, like, that's not a reason to throw it out, seriously. Uh, so, you know, this is very bright. E is a very... C is a bit... It's, a, it's slightly different. Like I said, this is not real, but it is. So, that's the least important lesson, but it's a good transition into the next one. Let's talk about how key affects instrumentation. So when you're writing songs, they're probably going to end up with instruments. Unless you write for, uh, what's the acapella groups? No, monks. Monks. Yeah. Yeah, Gregorian chants. Yes. Let's take a Gregorian chants on this panel. Thank you. I leave, I leave tomorrow, so. Uh, so, uh, I did this song last night called Magic Show, and um, if you've seen me at TrotCon, you can look up the video. It's, uh, I can't sing it. We do a demo of Magic Show, and it's in the original key of G. And I'm trying to remember how that song goes. <laughs> I just did it yesterday. So I couldn't sing it, unfortunately. It was way too high. And so I wanted to move it down to either E or D. And here's the problem that I had. I could have very, I really liked it in D. D was the best for my vocal fit. It was the best place that I liked the tone of it. But the original thesis of the song was that there was this chord progression I really liked that went like this. I liked the idea. I wanted something that crawled upwards. I really wanted you to feel like it was this rising thing because it's a song called Magic Show and the, the whole thematic element is that Trixie is coming back and she's good and she's going to put on a show. So I wanted it to rise up until you finally hit the chorus. So it rises up through these things and then finally you keep going back down during the verse until the very end of the verse you finally hit the very top and then it hits the chorus and it goes even higher. And I, that's what I really wanted to get across. So in terms of instrumentation, I have to think to myself, what's the main instrument going to be? And in my case, it was I wanted a really punk rock feel. Of course, it's going to be a guitar. So if I'm, tr if I'm in a situation where I don't know what key to put something in, I need to look to the main instrument. And in the case of a song where I'm collaborating with a vocalist, well, they're obviously the main instrument because uh, I want to work with them, and they have their own range that I don't know or and have to figure out. In this case, it was guitar. So I look at the guitar, and I'm playing the two different things, and it's, you know, there's, you got this, and then you got, you know. And both sound pretty good. But if you're familiar with a guitar, going from D, a full D chord, to an uh, E minor is just moving across from one side of the uh, neck to the other. But if you move from an E major to an F sharp, you move up. And I went back to the theme of the song. I wanted to move upwards in a rising action. So that's why I ended up choosing E, even though it's really hard to sing that song live because of that. And I really messed that up for myself. But it fit the theme and it fit the main instrument. So if you are writing for instruments, you need to understand you don't well, I mean, if you're writing for instruments, you don't need to understand to write a good song, mind you. But understanding how they work will only benefit you. And that's the real lesson here. That being said, I have another example. I, uh, about, especially talking about that for uh, both vocals and when you're doing instruments 
such as uh, synths or electronic music. I was working on this song with uh, Lady Aria called Alone in the Dark, and I originally composed it in the key of D minor, and she ended up having it lowered to G minor. And I don't know if you heard how low I went, it went like this. That's a long way from Equestria. And uh, so unfortunately, going that much lower, I had to not only completely re-record the guitar parts, I had to remix them because they now had a completely different EQ because the tone was so drastically lower. And then from there, that changed the whole MIDI instrumentation of the electronic elements because the synths were specifically uh, written, they were specifically designed for the key that they were, and coming down, it completely changed the EQ, thus changing the whole sound of the synths. And the synths had to be rewritten to better fit the song. So it's one of those things where you have to understand how key is going to affect everything. Because I could have, I could have ignored that and put out the song anyway, but it would have just been a, just a muddy mess of just lowness. And I mean, some people like muddy messes of lowness. I mean, I love Death Grips, but uh, yeah, somebody over there. Uh, but not everybody does. And at the end of the day, if you want your song to sound like that, make your song sound however you want. But if more knowledge will not be worse, and that's all I can say. So uh, moving on, going back to uh, Magic Show, I did have this problem, I mentioned it earlier, with the key of G, I couldn't uh, sing it. And if you're taking notes, I hope none of you are, please don't bother, it's gonna be recorded on Ponyville Live, woo! First round of applause, awesome. Uh, you'll notice that completely contradicts uh, lesson one, which is challenge yourself. And it's like, but Jeff, if you couldn't sing it, why not challenge yourself to sing it? Sometimes don't challenge yourself. No, you gotta work with what you got, but you can always get better at what you got. But sometimes you gotta work with what you got. And so here's the thing about songwriting, if you haven't noticed, every lesson is contradictory. Every song and every situation is gonna be completely different. And all you can do is gather enough tool sets that you can figure out the best thing to do for what you want in any given situation. And so I, I would encourage anyone to, if you're somebody who's a genre artist, I would encourage you to go outside of your genre just to learn it. Even if you come back, you'll know different things and it will only benefit you. And so this moves on to the biggest lesson in song. Oh wait, let me check my notes. Is this the biggest lesson? Yes. <laughs> uh, what time is it? That's a good question. Thank you. How long is this panel? Forty more minutes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here's the biggest lesson. So, going back to Magic Show, the original title, and I feel terrible because this was the title for six months and I thought this was a fine title. It was a song about Trixie putting on a magic show. I'm writing a song about Trixie going to Ponyville to put on a magic show and it was called Magic Mare. It's, it was about how she is a magical mare. This song about her going to Ponyville is called Magic Mare, and that's a terrible title, and I feel terrible that for six months I thought that was an okay title. So, <laughs> this song has gone through so much because it started out so terrible, and it's become like my favorite song. Uh, the original structure, how many of you know anything about how to structure songs or anything about that? You know, verse, chorus, bridge, whatnot? Well, if you know anything about that, you know, you know, most songs, like, you know, you listen to Green Day, and it's like, yeah, we got a verse, then a chorus, then a verse, then a chorus, then a bridge, and then we go back to the chorus. It's fun. It's nice. It's not too far from the norm. So here's the original structure of Magic Mare. Verse, chorus, bridge, completely unrelated to any of the melodies so far, chorus, a section where we do the verse again, but with circus sounds, Another verse, a chorus, a guitar solo, a chorus, a brand new bridge completely unrelated to anything we've had so far, 
and then the chorus. <laughs> so, <laughs> that sounds like a long song. It was less than two minutes. <laughs> the chorus was eight seconds long. <laughs> so, the first thing I did to make this better was take the chorus and make it more than eight seconds long. Because the thing about a chorus is, there's a lot of songs without choruses. And by a lot, I mean there's a lot of songs. So there's a lot of songs about, you know, anything. But uh, not a lot of those songs are popular. Losing My Religion is one of them, I think, maybe. Or, no, it doesn't have a, it doesn't have something. It's missing something. It's, it does have mandolin, I think, which is good. Uh, hi, I'm Mando Pony. Nice to meet you. Uh, <laughs> so the first thing I did to make Magic Mayor better was make the chorus more than eight seconds long. And what I ended up doing was uh, I, knowing that the original thesis of it, going back to that idea of going upwards, I had this idea of it goes and uh, or and so that was just it. That was that was the chorus right there. It was that short and. Um, so what I ended up doing was bringing it down. Instead of ending just on a, uh, on a resolve, what I ended up doing was you know, dropping the tempo a bit, raising it, uh, have, when it raised up to end, I instead brought it down to continue this thematic element of raising people up but then dropping a bit so that you can raise them up even higher. And so that's how I made the chorus longer. And one of the things that's great about songwriting is that if you have a thesis or some thematic element that you always want the song to be about, if you have that line, uh, uh, you can always refer back to it. And so if you notice the, if you remember, I had two bridges, both of which were completely unrelated to anything melodically in the song. I got rid of both of those. I don't even remember what they were. They're gone forever. Thank you. And uh, I wrote a new bit bridge based on the intro rather than on nothing. And you can have, you can have a song structured any way you want. Going back to this duality of there's no rules for songwriting, but these are a toolkit that will help make it better. You can have a bridge come out of nowhere and just be nothing unrelated to anything. That's fine. You can have a hundred bridges come out of nowhere. You can make your song 17 minutes long and nothing's repeated. That's fine. If that is what pleases you, because you shouldn't be songwriting for anybody but you, and that's what I like to do, which is why I have a million hundred billion songs. I only put out the worst ones. <laughs> and so I ended up with a structure where it was much more uh, mainstream, a verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, outro kind of thing. So what's the difference between going from a... Uh, uh, a very weird structure to a more mainstream structure. Is it better? For the song, it made it a stronger song. Is that gonna be your structure every time? Should you always do that structure, that mainstream verse chorus thing? Obviously, no. Has that structure withholded through the test of time? Yes. Is it perfect? No. So once again, you, there's no way to write songs. No, there's no way, you can't, you can't do it. Go home. <laughs> no, there's no right way to write songs. Um, and then going back to that lesson, the biggest lesson, write and then rewrite. Uh, I have this song called Alone in the Dark featuring Lady Aria, <laughs> I said that. Uh, the melody that's in it goes, I hid an ancient spell, like night it's setting in. That was the original melody, but when it was lowered from that to... I hid an ancient spell. Obviously, nobody could sing that. So I had to go through, I already had it all recorded, so I can't change the main structure unless I do a full thing. So it's like, what is the idea of this song? The idea of Alone in the Dark was that this phrase came to me, I think when I was asleep. They come to me when I'm asleep a lot, I wake up and I record it on my phone, and then I go back to bed. And then I listen in the morning, and usually it's terrible, but sometimes it's great. And so I had this idea of, I'm all alone in the dark. And if you visualize that, I'm all alone in the dark. 
So is that significant? No. But it's interesting because when I had to change the melody, which just went down, I, 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 I had a thing where it was like I can either raise it up and keep that tail ending that goes down and keep those notes and rewrite the original ones, or I can keep it where it is and rewrite the ending notes. So I figured, well, it's too low, got to bring it back up. What that ended up creating was a melody that mirrors melodically the chorus, and it became a hidden ancient spell, like night it's setting in. And then it does that thing where it goes down, but then it comes back up, and that's exactly what happens in the chorus. And that's interesting to me because I actually didn't realize that until I was preparing for this panel, but what that created was a recurring motif, which brings me to an interesting lesson. You might be smarter than you realize. You might accidentally, out of adversity, create something better, and that's why you rewrite. And so the next section on my list is talking about lyrics, and it's completely blank. I have not written that part of the panel yet, so I'm going to wing it. That being said, if you have any questions about lyrics, I'd rather just hear what those are, and then I can wing it from there. Or if you have any questions about anything involving songwriting, feel free to ask it. Bowtie. A song is like an essay? That's true. I, I, I like to think, uh, this is a good transition into lyrical writing. I'm going to leave the keyboard behind for now. I'm going to just sort of... Hey, what's up? Uh, so the thing about lyrics is that it's very easy and also difficult to write catchy lyrics because the thing about catchy lyrics is that a lot of people assume catchy means good. And a lot of people assume good lyrics are catchy. And there's a lot of lyrics I remember because of how much I hate them. <laughs> and that's true for most catchy songs. And there's a lot of lyrics I remember because of how much I love them. And then there's that gray area in between where I don't remember the lyrics. And there's enough of my songs that I don't remember the lyrics for, which is why I don't do them live. <laughs> because that would be embarrassing. Uh, uh, because they're particularly not good. And the thing about writing songs, and the thing about writing lyrics especially, is that if you want to write good lyrics, you should write a hundred songs, and they're all going to be bad, and then you write another one, and it'll be good. I mean, it's not a down-to-earth formula. It's not like a hundred and then a good one. But you have to write a hundred bad songs before you're going to write a good one. And that's just how it is. And I started writing songs when I was uh, in third grade. No, earlier than that. Because in third grade, I had a broken leg. But that is not relevant to you. <laughs> uh, I, I wrote a parody of Linkin Park's In the End about making a really cool sandwich but dropping it on the floor. <laughs> It's, it's, in the end, my sandwich was in pieces. <laughs> and so I'm really into lyrical storytelling. And I think the best lyrics that go back to the marriage of catchy and good tell a story. And there's catchy lyrics like, boom, clap, the beat goes on and on and on and on. That's really catchy. I don't remember what the lyrics are because they're not really telling me anything. But you guys know the, the broom broom vine? The, where this girl's like, broom broom, I'm in me mom's car. Somebody took this vine of this girl just in her car and they put it on the boom clap song. So it goes, boom clap, I'm in me mom's car. No beat goes on and on, get out me car. I remember that because that tells me a story. That tells me a story not through the lyrics, but that tells me a story that somebody looked at a vine that some teenage girl made, and this is very creepy, but, and they were like, you know what this needs to be? This, art, this medium is not complete. This vine needs to be a song. Not just any song, it needs to be Boom Clap from The Fault in Our Stars by John Green. I got paid $10 to say that. John Green's behind the projector, he's got his checkbook out. <laughs> and um, so the thing about the story of the lyrics is that is that the story that I'm going to remember and the story that you guys are going to remember, you look like 2013-era Sax Brony. It's very interesting. You with the sweater. You look like Sax Brony, but from 2013. It's actually very interesting. 
I'll have to get a picture after this. Uh, the story I like and the story you like is always going to be different, but you don't have to tell a story in, in a way like, uh, here, here's an example of a song that tells a story. I'm going to write it right now. I went to the grocery store, but they do not sell groceries anymore. You don't have to be that explicit about the story. You, here's the interesting thing about storytelling and lyrics. If, if you want to write evocative lyrics, you don't get out of the thesaurus and, and just write down the most beautiful words. Petrichor. You know, no. Uh, evocative lyrics come from your lyrics having a story to you. And if they have a story to you, no matter how vague they are, mind you, if they have a story to you, they will have a story to somebody because, going back to the idea that feelings are not real, but they are, if you write something with a story and it's something you connect to and you're telling a story in as few words or as vague as possible, that feeling of what you associate it with is going to come through and somebody is going to connect with it. And the interesting thing about it is that is that, that person is your best audience because everybody's going to connect to something. But there's five billion people out there, so there's a good chance a lot of them are going to connect to what you connect with. And that's where your audience is. The hard part is finding them. You had a question? Bowtie. Uh, I mean explicit as in the, the sense of being very methodical and uh, uh, yeah, telling everything. Yeah. Or, or I mean uh, being, being that uh, in, in the sense of a... Uh, yeah, literal. You don't literally have to tell a story like, I am Jeff Burgess, and this is my panel on how to write a song. And, you know, that's... <laughs> that's a story. But, but you can, you know, you can tell a story in, in, in any way that you want. And uh, I think boom clap tells a story, because you hear a boom, and then you clap. Like, maybe there's something in that. And to me, there's a story there. Uh, but you know, how much of a story is, is really anything? If you have any other questions about lyrics, if not, I'll just keep talking on the fly. What's going on? That's, uh, that's actually a very good question. I'm buying time. No, that's uh, great. The way that songs usually come to me is, you know, I will be in bed or in the shower, and I will have just one thing. I, I remember a song I wrote called Recklessly Impulsive where I was just sitting there just really thinking of something. I'm like, oh, you can't force inspiration. And then suddenly I had a melody. You can't force inspiration. Just, just you know, those two notes and a line of dialogue. And so I've written songs where I've sat down and I've written a ton of lyrics and then I figured out the melody. And I've written songs where I've had a melody and I've sat down and written lyrics for them. And going back to the idea of marriage, in my experience, writing either one alone is not as good of a solo process. When I was actually writing the songs with Forest Rain for Journey of the Spark, uh, it was a situation where she was doing the uh, music and I was doing the lyrics. So what I would do is, uh, or she'd send me a melody and I would come up with basically a full list of lyrics for this song based on just usually just a verse and then I would just like write up random things and I'd send that back to her and then she'd restructure that based on coming up with new melody for it and in a back and forth situation where we each are specifically in charge of one thing that's a very awesome process to have because it really lets you uh, especially if you find somebody whose brain works in a different way than yours. And I had a great time collaborating that way with Forest Rain because her brain is so melodical and so methodical uh, when it comes to writing songs. And me, I'm just like, what sounds good? Just let it come on out. And that's why it was great to write lyrics because I could just tell these stories that these characters are supposed to sing, especially for a musical setting where story is the forefront of the reason they're singing and then she could just take that and digest it and and churn it into the butter that is a good song and so 
what I think about writing those in tandem though, especially in a solo setting, is that that has the best results if for me, because if you, if you come up with a full song and you have all of the verse and chorus mapped out exactly how it's gonna be, but you have no lyrics, what happens when you write the lyrics and you have too much space to fill and you end up with extra parts? I wrote this song called um, Leaking, which was uh, uh, on an album called Eternal, and also I'm So Scared. It was on two albums because I'm a sellout. Uh, I'm So Scared is available, by the way. Uh, I'm at table M1. Uh, that being said, uh, it was too long, but it took the amount of time in being too long. It got repetitive, but I needed the full time to tell the story. So my options were either I could have increased the tempo, but then I felt it got too fast. I could have... Um, I could have changed one of the verses to be a bridge, but I felt that strayed too much from the theme because the idea was that uh, Celestia is dying. I'm, I know, rest in peace, so sad. And Twilight Sparkle's singing this sort of funeral dirge to her. And the idea was that it's such a focused moment that I want to establish this set melody. It's a song with no chorus. It's just a verse, and then a verse, and then a verse. I didn't want to go to a chorus. I just wanted to sit this one thing where the whole world, she puts on blinders and just this is all that's going on. So I didn't want to do that. So what I ended up doing was I realized I had to cut one of the verses in half. What that did, it, it made a variation. Here's what I've learned about variation in songwriting, especially from the time I spent making mashups. You might not notice something but your brain does. So when somebody does a verse, and then they sing the verse again, and then they sing a verse again, that's repetitive. If they sing a verse, and then a verse, and then the second half of a verse, you might not notice that that's happened because, you know, you've heard the verse before, it's whatever, but you're refreshed because it changed. Your brain has said, this is new information to me, but you just as a listener go, yeah, it's the, the verse again, this is nice. You had that moment where something changed just in a split second and your brain was able to say, this is new information, I am not bored. Uh, I don't remember the question, but uh, uh, in terms of writing lyrics and music together, what I ended up doing with that song that is relevant to that question <laughs> is that I cut the verse in half and I rewrote the lyrics of the story so that they were a more condensed, shorter version, uh, which cut out like some of my favorite lines from the song, but unfortunately, it better served the story. And unfortunately, you're gonna cut things you like. But what's interesting about that, uh, nope, I forgot what was interesting about that. Oh, I do, I do remember. Because I wanted to be a funeral dirge, very focused on one element, cutting it down, focused it even more, and I told the story in less words, and I made it more focused, going back to the thematic elements of the song. You always want to go back to whatever your thesis is. Uh, were there any more questions about songwriting? What's, what do we got? Uh, software oh, software. Good question. I, uh, I currently use Logic Pro X, and a, an Alesis 49 key MIDI keyboard. And I do pretty much everything in there. Um, I actually have a long history of audio software. I used GarageBand for nine years. Uh, my copy of GarageBand was so customized that it looked nothing like GarageBand. It was, it, it was very sad. But uh, there's a lot of great software out there for making music, and there's actually a free program. Well, it's not free, but uh, it's free to use forever, and they suggest a donation of, if you're a student, I think it's like 20 or $30. It's called Reaper, right? Isn't that called Reaper? Reaper, Reaper yeah. Uh, Halos Foss uses it, and uh, it's, it's a very good program, very comparable to any uh, uh, any paid digital paid digital audio workstation that you can use. And um, in terms of software though, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what software you use because you can always get better at software. But if, if you get yourself the top of the line equipment, but you still don't really know what 
makes a good song or why people's brains will say to one thing, oh, I like that, but it, does, it says, eh, no, to boom, clap, I'm in my mom's car, then you're not quite going anywhere, really. But yeah, I use Logic Pro, and it's an amazing program. I highly recommend it. Logic Pro X. If you have a Mac, if you have a Windows, meh, I don't know. That's a very good question. I'm stalling again. I do do that. Uh, in terms of recording uh, actual instruments, uh, usually what I end up doing is I record uh, saxophones, clarinets, mandolins, acoustic guitars. Um, I used to direct, or I used to record actual uh, electric guitar amplifiers. And what I ended up doing now is I use virtual amplifiers. I use a Line 6 Pod XT, which basically takes all the fun out of uh, and by fun, I mean all of the busy work out of recording guitar where you set up an amp and you make it do what it is and you put it in a booth and you mic it up a couple times and you record it. Instead, it just you just plug in your guitar to this little box and it tells the computer what the amp sounds like. And it's very great. In terms of mixing those two elements, uh, it's all about EQ. And this is something I'm still learning. Basically, I used to put out albums where the vocals were way louder than everything. And then... I was like, you know what, let me stop doing that. That seems like a problem. Oh, actually, here's a tip, unrelated, but I'll get back to it. If you're making comedy music, make the vocals a little bit louder so that the brain can better perceive them faster, and then the comedy flows faster. Listen to, uh, wait, listen to French and Saunders' parody of Madonna, and then listen to the Madonna song they're parodying. The mix is very subtly different in that way so that you can better hear the jokes. Interesting. Being said, it all comes down to EQ. So after I stopped making songs where the vocals were way too loud, I started making songs where the drums were way too quiet, but everything else was not bad. And then I started making songs where the drums were way too loud and everything else was too quiet. And now I'm onto this kick where I'm gonna try and make them all be a good level. Because I think that's a good thing to do. But it all comes down to EQ and compression because you can imagine that a song, you can imagine that the audio waves of a song are like a highway. And what you want is a traffic jam. You want everything filled, but you want everybody moving at the same speed. Because if all the cars are filled, but nobody's moving, it's gonna sound terrible because it's just constant stuff. But using EQ, you can bring out the natural frequencies of anything you record, or the natural frequencies of like a synth, or a, a fake piano, which is one of the fake instruments that I often record because it's hard to find a real piano. And you can, you can decide how to instrument your song based on filling up the spectrum of audio. So it's like if you have so many things, but you're like, oh, something at the uh, 500 hertz level I'm missing. You know, you think about it and you find an instrument or a synth sound that's right about 500 hertz. You can put that in there, bring out the EQ at, at 500 hertz, and then you filled in that spot and you can create a, a, a competently and full sound out of very simple instruments just by adjusting the way that they sound. Oh, thank you. Good. I, 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 I thought those were bad, but I'm, I'm trying, well, here's the problem with making punchy drums. I'll get to your question after that. Here's the problem with making punchy drums. If you want something to stand out, you're going to have to pick what you want to stand out. Because if you want really punchy drums, but like also like a really punchy bass guitar, but I want that guitar to really have a punch to it. And it's like, the vocals really got to just punch the audience. If you want, just want that synth to just punch you in the face. Just, you're just going to get punched in the face. And nobody likes to get punched in the face. Unfortunately, you have to pick what's going to gonna pack a punch. And the great thing about the EQ spectrum is that you can pick different things across it to pack a punch, but you can't, it's gonna be very difficult to have a punchy bass and a punchy kick drum because they're right next to each other. What's interesting that you can do with the bass guitar is you can bring up the higher frequencies to really bring out the slap in it, which will complement the kick drum without overpowering the kick drum, because what the bass does is help fill in those, those lower frequencies to make it a more full sound, but you don't want too much of it that all you hear is, is bass, because bass is 
beautiful in electronic music as a way to just feel your heartbeat. And I'm trying to make songs where you can feel your heartbeat, and that's how I want the kick drum to be. But it's like, if I do that, I need to sacrifice something else so that that can be what stands out. And if you want a really powerful snare that's really going to punch you in the face, there's other frequencies by the snare that you're going to have to compromise and bring those down. So that being said, you can't have everything punch you. But as you get better at EQ and you do more songs, you're going to put out bad songs. Just deal with it. I've done it. We've all done it. Uh, you'll figure out what worked in one song, and then you go to the next song, you do the same thing with variation, and you do that variation until you're better. And that's just how progress is, continuous improvement. So what's the question about lyrics? <laughs> Uh, well, that's. Uh, I mean, when I, when I think about uh, writing songs from the first person, I, 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 I've actually been trying not to do that recently because I do it so much, but it's not working. That's just sort of how I write songs. Here, the problem that I have is I can't. It's hard for me to relate to songs in the third person that are vague. Like, ooh, girl, you're so beautiful. It's like, okay, who is this girl? It's like, ah, oh, I love her brown, blue, yellowish eyes. I love her blonde, black, brown hair. It's so vague. It's, they're trying to sell you on romance. It's not real. And so what I've learned, actually, this applies to narrative, uh, anything narrative. The more vague you are, the less people are going to connect with it. And that seems like it makes less sense because you think you want to be vague so that everybody can get it. But here's what I have learned. The more specific you are, the more people will relate to it. Because this is going back to the idea that if you tell a story that's really meaningful to you, people are going to feel what you felt. Whether or not they've been where you've been, they're gonna feel what you felt. So the more specific you are in terms of your narrative, because uh, it's, it's I, I had an idea for a, a really bad indie rock movie. Uh, like, it's, it's, it's called, it's, it's like a Beatles-themed love story about like a girl with blue hair, her name is Abby Rhodes. And uh, she falls in love with like a guy named Paul McCartney. But uh, the idea is, is that if you're really specific, uh, people will connect to it more whether or not they've been there. And so going back to the idea of writing songs in the first person, I think that's a phenomenal thing you can do. And if you listen to an artist like uh, uh, Mom, who is a midi rock queen, she is the, the, the savior we've all been waiting for. Punchy, I know, right? Punchy midi drums, that's amazing. She always writes in the first person, and she's so evocative. And whether or not you've been there, you can really feel it, because all of that emotion is coming through. And if, if, you're, if you're performing lyrics, I, I love to do them with emotion. I know other people don't. I collab with a lot of people who specifically want me to tone it down, because they, they want it to be more methodical and melodical. But uh, uh, in terms of... Uh, first person versus like second person like you know why you're here you're doing stuff it's fun it's like I don't like to be told what to do I don't want to hear a song that's telling me how to feel I want to let the song tell me how it feels and if I feel it I can feel it with them I don't know if that answers your question but that's something yeah oh actually you first because you had less questions Just give it to me straight. Give it, give it to me straight, Doc. Am I dying? Am I dying?
There's, there's, uh, there's a new platform coming out, and I just read about it. I can't remember what it is, but it's a new file format where it's just the stems to the song. And it's basically for people who are like home DJs. You can just download a file and read it in a special program, and it just shows you all the stems, and you can mess with them already. The problem for that being is that that's basically the same as just downloading all the stems and just putting them in a timeline. So, you know, there's the, there's the, there's the, there's the pros and cons of that. But as a file format, the fact that is starting to exist, and I don't imagine a world where the average consumer would do that, but to like audiophiles, people who are really into sound, I can see people getting into that file format and playing it in their player and manipulating what's going on just as they listen, even with no intention of, of remixing the song. So it's cool. It comes down to the thing I was talking about earlier where you, you can't have everything punch you. So if you want the vocals to stand out, record your vocals, just solo them, look at them on a, if you, any, almost any audio workstation will let you look at a real time visual of where your vocals are showing up on the spectrum. Look at where that is and write your instrumentation or choose instruments, uh, write your melodies so that they leave that area alone. And then you can add some reverb to fill in the bottom, like what's missing, onto your vocals. But if you leave that area alone, and I love doing a lot of acoustic guitar stuff, and I mean, I can't speak to the fact that I don't let the vocals get muddy sometimes because I know what I want, and sometimes I'm just, I just want to do it. But one of, the, one of the better things that you can do is, is pay so much attention that you decide rather than singing and playing here, which you know actually uh, somewhere around here would be closer to the you know frequency of my voice. Instead of playing down here, I'll play up here, and it's going to change the way the song sounds. But you have to decide. It comes down to marriage. What do you want to get out of the song? Do you specifically want these guitar chords in this thing, or do you want it to sound really good to somebody who knows what songs sound like? And so. It's, it's, it's a, you gotta give a little, take a little, and let your poor heart break a little. Um, uh, if there's any more questions, I think I have like five minutes. Uh, do you find that the songs that you most enjoy writing also enjoy performing? Uh, that's true, yes. I enjoy performing a lot of songs, and some I cannot perform, unfortunately, just due to the circumstances of how much time I have and who's available and just the full instrumentation. But I don't perform songs that I don't enjoy performing at the end of the day. And as a consequence of familiarity, the songs that I perform the most are, end up being the songs that I remember the most. Because, you know, when I release a song and I don't perform it, then I never go back to it. But if I have to perform it, then I have to practice it every day because I have a terrible memory and I've got these fingers that barely work and it's very interesting. But yes, the answer is yes. What's your inspiration for Autumn Nights? For Autumn Nights? Uh, uh, actually, BronyCon 2013. Basically, uh, hanging out with all of the musicians who all knew each other but I had not made friends with literally anybody who were musicians. So I was like the only guy there who like wasn't in the friend group like yet. And so I had this idea of, of being on an equal playing field with somebody and yet being an outsider. Because the idea of, of, of an outsider in, uh, in narrative is always this somebody, it's always an underdog, somebody who rises to the top. But that's not true all the time. What happens if you're on the same playing field and you are an outsider and you want to get up, but you don't know how to get up without getting in, but you don't want to get in without selling out. And that's what Autumn Nights is all about. It's this idea that Vinyl Scratch wants to get in, but she doesn't want to sell out. And at the end of the day, she sacrifices all of her personal relationships, obsessing over that, and it becomes 
her hubris becomes her own downfall. But that was the inspiration for that. I love BronyCon 2013, and I've since made friends with all the musicians because they're great people. I just didn't know them yet. It's, it, I, I'm, not, I'm not implying that I'm vinyl scratched and that I was just like, oh, I gotta get into this group. It's just I didn't know them. So, no, it's, it, it, I love that album. It's, it's, uh, thank you. So yeah, I don't know. I, in the back. Uh, uh, what would I recommend in terms of what? If you got a Mac, just play with GarageBand. I did it for nine years, unfortunately. Uh, it's great. If you've got Windows, get Reaper. Play with it. Just play with it. And in terms of songwriting, here's my pretty much advice. Listen to the album How Does an Electrostatic Motor Work by Logan Whitehurst and the Junior Science Club. Uh, rest in peace, by the way, taken too soon. Uh, it is a masterclass on lyricism and songwriting and melodies and how and reprise and how songs connect. And it's just beautiful. It's a comedy album, but there aren't jokes. Yeah. Oh God, that's, uh, I think my favorite song by me is actually a song I wrote called Rebuilding an Image from an unreleased rarity musical that I wrote that I was talking about last night with somebody. But uh, I don't know if that's ever gonna see the light of day, but it's really good, it's really hard to sing. What did you have for breakfast this morning? Uh, omelet. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say the most prolific. Uh, I don't know if you've seen I'm a Tune Link. He puts out something like every day. I know you've seen it. There's a channel called Weedy Yeah. Uh, there, I don't know. There's, there's a couple of like funny songs that I've made that have been you know, off color and I've, I've taken them out of circulation as best as I can. And, Oh, thank you. Those are my favorite. Uh, I mean, there's a song I made called We Could Have Been So Much that I'm not happy with because it's a situation where I made the full instrumentation and then I came up with lyrics. And as a consequence, it's way too long and boring and drawn out. And I, I really love the melody of the chorus, but I hate the verses and I really want to rework it. But I just, I would love to just forget the original version I put out. But, you know, the, I put out so much stuff and I hate like half of it. I, I hate like three-fourths of the stuff I put out and you should see the stuff that I don't put out. I, I hate that a lot, <laughs> but yeah. So yeah, I think that's the end, unless they have, I've got. Okay, I mean, so yeah, whatever. If you have any more questions, you can come talk to me. But otherwise, yeah, what's up? Thank you. Well, I mean, it was about a fanfic. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I, I was wondering, are there any songs that like, aren't solely about a story? Or, like, I'm not saying like, I want you to go do that. I'm well, I, uh, recently I've been writing a lot of, I've been doing a lot of acoustic demos and just putting them on my SoundCloud. And what I was doing for a while in the most recent songs that I've been doing is I've been writing based on the dreams I've been having. And so I've been writing songs that are telling stories that don't make sense. And so I wrote this song called Tiny Pony Chairs. <laughs> it's not what it sounds like. It's, it's about the combination of, uh, of three dreams I had, one in which like, I, I drowned, and one in which uh, uh, I opened a portal through my couch, and also about the story of my sister trying to buy illegal moonshine out of the back of somebody's car. So I, I combine these three things into a story that I, I tell very vaguely in the song, but using very, uh, uh, very specific lyrics about like going to a place. It's idea these two people are trying to find illegal wine in Pennsylvania. And so they go in this person's car and go to their house. They're blindfolded and taken down into the secret wine cellar but what they discover is these tiny pony-sized chairs in the hall which lead them to believe that this person not only has a living, a sort of a My Little Dashy type situation where Rainbow Dash is being held captive in their house, 
there is a portal opening up in their couch and it's about to end the world. So that's what that song's about. <laughs> and that's a story, but it makes no sense. And I think that falls under the thing of, of uh, you can do that. And, and I think it's a very good song. And if you read the lyrics, it'll mean something to you that's different from what it means to me because, because I say the thing so explicitly and yet I fill in my own blanks. And if you leave blanks, people will fill them in with their own experiences. And I think that's the best way to make people to relate to your stuff, is learn which blanks to leave and which blanks to fill. So yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm here if you want, or if you want to leave, that's whatever. I, yeah, I'm still here, yeah. Oh, and I, uh, was that a, sure, what's up? Do you mean like, uh, like, have you, have you heard my Discord remix? You should look it up. It's, 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 if Death Grip's question was how could you make our music worse, it's that. It's, No, that's the, that's the Yerby Bronies original vocal. Yeah, it's, it's, which is why it's so funny that, that Tombstone is the one in the video, because he had nothing to do with it. But yeah, no, I love noise in music, and I love genres like that, and I love Death Grips. Their new album is so good, you should all get it. Oh, also, if you do listen to the new Death Grips, first off, it's not very appropriate for children. That being said, the opening track is called I Break Mirrors with My Face in the United States, but I'm going to ruin it all for you. It sounds like he's saying I Break Mares with My Face in the United States. It's, it's, it's one of the best ones. What a way to start an album. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, if you have any other questions, I will be at table M1 selling copies of Autumn Night Sand. I'm so scared. Thank you, Pony Bear Live. Thank you, everybody on the AV team. Thank you, Babs Corn. I want to disturb the other panels. Ah!